Chill, chill, chill. Real off radio. Real off radio. Plant seed and water seed. Say, 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 Welcome to Real Talk Radio, the show that says just because you do not attend with them doesn't mean that you're not in it. The Him being Jesus, the show that plants seeds and water seeds, but God gives the increase. Let's talk about it on Real Talk Radio. This show is a continuation of the Church of Hope Revolution. Enjoy the show. Yeah. I can't even help it, bro. That joint just be. <laughs> just be you ever listen to it in the car, bro? You ever listen to it? Bro. It just had that joint thumping <laughs> in your ears, bro. Like, planting seeds. And, man, listen. As you can already tell, man, uh, we here at Real Talk Radio are, are incredibly excited about this show. And, you know, not that we're not excited about every show, but this show right here is uh, one that is really uh, going to have some very important and vital information for folk uh, who are still within the church and those who have recently come out. Today's topic is the church is dangerous, period. The church is dangerous. Now, I know when people hear that type of language and hear those type of uh, assertions that there's a level of, uh, for some agreement, for some frustration, some who are deeply intertwined and connected with their particular church are going to be very upset and angered by it. But what I ask everyone to do is before you leap to any type of conclusions or assumptions, that you actually listen to the show, that you listen to what we say and that you actually listen to our heart behind this topic. Uh, We're not here just simply to uh, be IC terrorists, to attack the church. We have a tremendous love for the body of Christ, so we hold true to the statement that the church is dangerous. So today, March 20th, 2016, on this episode of Real Talk Radio, we're going to dig in and talk about why the church is dangerous. Why the church is dangerous. Good morning, fellas. How y'all feeling, man? Good, good man. man. Good. Yeah, ready to good, tackle good, this good. joint, man. Good. We good over here, though. No doubt. All right, let's dig in. Let's dig right in. Dre, brother, this is, uh, you know, one of the topics that you gave birth to, bro. You added some incredible insight to this topic to bring it to the brothers for us to chop it up, man. What's on your mind this morning? Go ahead and lead the way, bro. Well, one of the things that's on my mind this morning, um, you know, is one of the reasons why I believe that the church is dangerous is because uh, there is a huge, how can I put this? There is a huge um, amount of peer pressure placed on the body of Christ um, that basically trickles from the head down, Okay. What do I mean by that? What I mean is that a lot of times you have people who are um, – whose pastors have taught them certain things. You understand what I'm saying? And when you're still in the – when you're still in the church and you still love your church and you still you, – you know, you love your pastor and whatnot, certain things are just not going to be done. For instance um, – Let's say you wanted to have a drink. Now, the Bible doesn't say there's anything wrong with having a drink, okay? The moment someone sees you uh, sees you taking a drink, like they did with Leandria, automatically she's, you know, she's labeled as a backslider or a reprobate just because she took a drink based on what pastors taught you. You understand what I'm saying? And mm-hmm. it's just not right. What it does is that it throws people into a state of self-condemnation that they shouldn't be in, especially when the Bible states that there is no, there is now no condemnation to those who are in Christ through the Spirit. Okay, so you have a lot of people who are walking around that have a lot of self condemnation, self doubt going around, and that's potentially dangerous to a person if they can't shake it. One of the reasons, um, one of the things that um, that is very unshakable 
okay? Um, one of the things that I was bringing to the fellas um, as far as this topic was concerned was there was a clip that I saw. Um, it was a documentary on, uh, what's his name, Benny Hinn. And mm-hmm. in the documentary, there was a man, you know, he was, he, he was a father, he was a husband, he had, he had a wife, and he had two sons. His youngest son had cancer, okay? He had a brain tumor completely debilitated. Now, he wanted Pastor Benny Hinn to heal his son through the power of the Holy Ghost, okay? So what happens is he goes to, he goes to a Benny Hinn um, ministry, and, you, you, know, you know, one of his conferences, and he makes a pledge. Now, normally, you know, you go to a church, you know, they, they ask you to make a pledge. You know, there's a $25, there's a $50, there's a $100, mm-hmm. and so mm-hmm. forth and so on. But Benny Hinn starts you off at $1,000, all the way up to $10,000, okay? Mm. The man couldn't afford $10,000, and he thought that use it by, by doing $1,000, he wasn't putting enough effort into trying to get his child healed, so he pledged $2,000. Well, here's what happened. The child dies. So mm. the interviewer who's now interviewing this man who's lost his child asked him, if there's anything that he could have done or is there anything that he did in his past that could have been the cause of this, his, the first thing out of his mouth was yes. There were some things that I probably did in my, in my past that caused this to happen to my son, you know, and he was really feeling grieved about that. He was really feeling down about him, almost to a suicidal level. I know plenty yeah. of people in the body of Christ who feel exactly the same way. Something happens to them, something happens to a family member, and next thing you know, they're blaming themselves based on a teaching that they got from their pastor. We mm-hmm. have to talk about this we have to talk about this thing because people are people are being A led astray, B, they're giving false doctrine, and B, they're being placed in bondage that they need not be in. Okay, so mm-hmm. I think that's what we, you know, we really need to talk about this thing. Mm-hmm. That's good. That's good. Hey, Rob, but <laughs> uh, when we, but when the, you know, we're going to get right into the victim blaming and the peer pressure because I think that's a a really dangerous aspect of the church. But what we don't want to do is we don't want to just assume that everybody is on the same page with, uh, you know, thoughts of understanding what the church is and what it's not. I think there's some things that, you know, we as mature believers sometimes forget that we, everybody that we're talking to is not eating meat. There are still some babes who have just come out who don't have the same type of understanding that we have, and that's not some type of uh, passive-aggressive, humble brag. It's just the reality. When we say the church specifically, what do we mean when we say the church When we're saying that the church is dangerous, we're talking about the church system we're talking about the the system of church the the uh institutionalized church system the thing called church we're not talking about the people the uh the people that's a, a totally separate uh thing we're we're our love for the people is what is causing us to call the institutional church system dangerous because we have seen the institutional church chew people up and spit them out We've seen it time and time again. Some of us have experienced it, and uh, so that's the, that's why we 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 say that the church system itself, as an entity, is a dangerous thing. And we're, we, what we set out to do all the time here on Real Talk Radio is actually save people from the system. You know what I mean? Yeah, and, and just to piggyback off of that, because I want to come back to Dre with the you know the peer pressure aspect for some examples of how we've seen that. But the one aspect that when we say the church is to put it in this context, even Benny Hinn and the false doctrine and some of his utter foolishness that he perpetuates, he is a part, a piece of the church system. He is right. not the, you know, the church. He's a part of what we're talking about in the context of this discussion, the institutionalized church system. So mm-hmm. it's really to be clear. So when some of you know, Dre, how folks, when they listen to these shows, man, or listen to read some of the Facebook posts and tweets that we put out, they immediately take it personal 
that we're talking about their particular pastor, their particular church. It's really integral that we break that down. But when it comes to the peer pressure and the victim blaming aspects, right, what, what would that look like? Give us a, a, a kind of a, a clear-cut vision of what that type of thing would look like. Peer pressure. Uh, let's see. Let's look at one of my uh, particular instances. Um, at the church that I, okay, here we go. Peer pressure. Um, I'm getting ready to go out of town and, you know, or I want to go, how about this? I want to go and visit another church. Mm. You know, a friend of mine invited me to go to another church. You know, it's, you know, it's live over there. You know, pastor's great speaker, you know. So I say to a friend of mine that goes to the church that I go to, you know, I'm I'm, I'm going to skip church this week over here. I'm going, you know, I've been invited to my friend's church. I'm going over there. Well, did you talk to pastor about that? Well, you know you got to be on post, right? How is pastor going to, you know, do what she needs or he needs to do without you being there? Now, next thing you know, you got a whole bunch of guilt all over you because you've already gave a commitment to go to go check out somebody else's church without discussing it with your pastor. Now, first and foremost, the Bible doesn't teach us that we need to discuss things like that with people who are supposed to be on our level anyway. Right. Okay. Um, but the effect that it has on that particular person, okay, like I said, the guilt that comes that comes on a person when you haven't gone through, a.k.a. the proper channels or, or used the proper protocol in order to um, get permission to go to somebody else's church is ludicrous. Mm. But because this is what we've been taught and what we have accepted, people feel God and injustice by accepting that invitation. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's that's good, Rob. What do you think, bro? What's your thoughts on that? Um, yeah, it's just to uh, to you know, kind of give like a I guess a, a high level overview, man. It's that it's just that bondage, man. That that is unnecessary bondage that is created by the religious system. And see, this isn't this isn't anything new. This is you know what was going on back in uh, Jesus' time when he was dealing with the Pharisees, and you know we we did a show, we've done a couple of shows um, dealing with that that Pharisee spirit, man. But um, definitely uh, stuff like if you aren't in your particular church body's services on a particular Sunday, um, you haven't cleared it with, with the pastor or, or this, that, and the third, then uh, then something is supposed to be wrong with that. That is part of that religious construct that unnecessary places people in unnecessary bondage. I, I went through that myself uh uh, when I was in the church system, I was I was talked to about uh, not being in in service. You know, when I wasn't uh, on post, as it were. As, you know, as Andre put it, when I wasn't on duty uh, in, in my capacity in the church system at the time, I was an armor bearer. Um, so I went through that exact same thing. Um, I mean, from from that to bringing monetary tithes into the church. I mean. Uh, you know the, that that aspect that we you know we often uh, talk about. I mean, it's just so many things, man that that comes with that whole mentality that someone has to perform for the church system. And see what what happens is that bondage that's created by the church system. Wh- what it is is it, it's man made, meaning it's man's. Uh, set of rules and regulations that they have placed upon believers that believers have to perform for their satisfaction. So believers then uh, get into the system and they, they get under this, 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 this school of thought that they have to perform to basically please their leaders in the church system Mm -hmm. ostensibly 
to please God, but it's really to please man. That's what that's really what's going on. On the on the surface level of it's supposed to be pleasing to God, but see God isn't tripping if you don't go to church this Sunday or if you don't go to church next Sunday or Sunday after that, or if you don't go to church and you and you decide to visit another church body, God ain't concerned about that. He ain't holding that against you. Man is holding right. that against you. Man is holding that against you because maybe they expect you to be present in their assembly. You know what I mean? That's man. But trust yeah. me, God ain't tripping. He ain't tripping if you don't bring another penny into that building. He's not even yeah. concerned about that. Yeah. You He's know, another another example. Go ahead, Drew. Oh, another quick example of that is when, let's say, you have something um, in particular that you want to do for yourself. Let's say you're a musician and you want to, you know, you, you, you want to make CDs of, you know, you know, of yourself, maybe even try to get a record deal, whatever the case may be. Um, that pastor or your church leaders, whomever, will always hold above you the fact that the vision of the house should come first. Mm-hmm. Then whatever it is that you want to do once you know the vision of the uh, of, of the church has been met, um, then you can do what you want to do. Okay, it's just another set of of, of bondage. It's another it's another way to guilt people into doing what a man wants you to do rather than doing what God has probably placed in your heart to do. Mm-hmm. True. Yeah, true and, that. It, and, and <laughs> you guys are listening. You guys are listening to Real Talk Radio today, man, and we're talking about today's topic is the church is dangerous. Mm -hmm. You got your boy Big L on the line, you got the homie Rob, and you got the homie Dre on. The call-in number for the show, if you have questions, comments, or criticisms, is 661-449-9951. Press 1, and we'll try to get to you as soon as possible. The only thing that we ask is that you try to make your comments brief, and if you have a question, just get right into that joint because... There will be tons of callers on the line, and we want to get a chance to get everybody. The aspect of the church being dangerous, though, is the fact of you're not able to see the danger of the church being dangerous. When you're in the church, you are conditioned and given this thought process forcibly at times that you cannot live without your church. You cannot have worship without your church. You cannot have fellowship. You can't have prayer. You can't hear a word. Even worse, you can't get healing. You can't get a financial blessing outside of those four walls of that system, that church. It Mm -hmm. teaches you that everything that you need spiritually is connected to the church. I know some people who are directly connected to a church and who hold that type of theory and thought process are going to believe that that is okay. But here's the thing, the problem. The problem is Jesus should be the source for all those things I just mentioned. The Holy Spirit is the one that should be leading you into authentic worship, authentic fellowship, authentic prayer life, authentically hearing a word, but the system itself, the church, teaches that you need to have those things in order for you to have a life as a Christian. So here's the problem with that. The church is sitting in a seat that doesn't belong in. The church Mm -hmm. has become the mediator between you and Christ. It is the Mm -hmm. spot. It It hinders you. And I think that's the one thing, fellas, that when we begin to talk about the consequences of the church being dangerous, which we're going to spend more time dealing with on the later half of the show, is the fact of it hinders your growth. It hinders your ability to actually be able to see clearly for your for yourself what your spiritual life should look like, for your family, and for your community. It gets in the way. It prevents you from actually having an authentic relationship with Christ. Because, Rob, what it does is it makes you have a relationship with the church first. Mm -hmm. And without having a relationship with the church, it gives the impression that you can't have a relationship with Christ. 
Right. And w- when you said that um, that it, it, may, it puts the, the church in a seat that it doesn't belong in, it makes the church the mediator. It's the church and all of its trappings, so it's the church and its leaders. There's this unhealthy reverence for church leaders inside this system. If you think about it, if you really think about it, where else do do these people have any type of influence? Nowhere but inside these church buildings. That I mean, that should should let you know right off the bat. I mean, your pastor can't uh, walk up to you anywhere else and 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 make you do anything. But inside the church building, you you know you kind of like kowtow to their every whim or their every thought process. Um, it's Again, just like Elle said, it places the church system and all of its trappings, leaders, uh, men with titles, all types of stuff, uh, into a, a seat that it doesn't belong in, and it actually hinders your relationship with Christ because Christ is who you're supposed to be focused on. And the system actually it actually teaches you that it's amazing because it's 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 mental gymnastics that you have to actually perform, whether you know it or not. You're performing mental gymnastics in order to to be uh, beholden to the system because it teaches you that by adhering to all of the rules and standards of the church system by revering its leaders by placing the, those leaders in direct. Uh, uh, Opposite. I, I, what's the word I'm looking for? It, in the basically in the way of your relationship with Christ, um, it teaches you by doing that that you are serving Christ. So it teaches you that by uh, by doing everything that your pastor says, by thinking like your pastor, by talking like your pastor, by going to church every Sunday, by paying tithes, it's teaching you that that you're serving Christ by doing that when that is a, a, totally antithetical to Scripture. It's totally foreign to Scripture. No, nothing in Scripture supports that. So it does hinder your relationship with Christ. It hinders your your you, you can, it, it, it hinders your very vision of who Christ is and what He's done for us. Yeah, and I think the the key that we want people to to hear, man, is I know telling you that the church is dangerous is provocative. We we know that we understand. And that wasn't the intent. This is not some clickbait show where we get you to click in and then all of a sudden we give you something else. No, 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 no. It's really important for us to lay the foundation for you to get the picture for why the church is dangerous. Now, here's what we're not saying. I'm not saying, Rob's not saying, Dre's not saying, or anyone else is saying, you know what I mean, you should stop going to church. Don't go to church. That's right. Or leave the church. Now I'm gonna give, I'm gonna give you I'm gonna give you my personal opinion here, and it's really important for you to hear me. If after I lay down the foundation of why something is dangerous, whether it be going to church or playing in traffic, if you continue to do either one of those things, that is purely up to you. You've actually made a conscious decision to reject the truth to continue on the path that you're on. As someone, and let me continue with that same sort of analogy and metaphor. As a child, I was hit by a car living in Philadelphia. Cars is flying down these little streets like mm-hmm. crazy. I, I don't, mm-hmm. I can't even begin to explain to you how fast they drive. I was hit by a car three times. Okay, three times. So mm-hmm. I got to a point where I can tell people, "Listen, bro, if you go on and trying to cross Seventh and Allegheny." You need to look both ways because they are going to be flying up and down that street. Now, I am someone who is was a victim of said getting hit by a car. The same sort of thing for me as someone who was in the church system who not only saw these dangers that we've mentioned, but I also participated in giving these dangers out. I was a mm-hmm. culprit. I was someone mm-hmm. who was looking to enforce these dangers. That's right. Who propagated these things. So when I'm telling you that the church is dangerous, I'm not someone who just has a, you know, on the outside looking in, peering through the window. I'm telling you, I participated in this. So in my own personal relationship, the church impeded my growth 
and my relationship with Jesus. And it wasn't until I left the institutionalized church system that I developed and matured in my relationship with Jesus. But what I'm not saying is I'm not saying that you're not a believer. I'm not saying that you, you know, that you should leave all those things. I'm pointing out the dangers we are. And I think sometimes when people hear this type of topics, they they immediately want to jump to these crazy conclusions. That's not what I'm saying. But I'm telling you that this thing right here is dangerous. Mm-hmm. It's dangerous for you, it's dangerous for your family, and it's dangerous for your community. Flat out. Yeah. Dre, you was about to say something, bro. All right. Oh no, I'm good. I'm I'm, I'm okay. good. As a matter of fact, um, if you can hit on that community aspect about it, how dangerous it is for the community, that would be great. And, and, and Rob, <laughs> Rob is someone who also he knows the inner workings of Philly for having family there. He, he knows what I'm talking about. He he understands the analogies that that we use, that I use in regards to Philly. The mm-hmm. same thing with the community aspect. I think this goes with any, uh, and not to try to inject race into the conversation, but it will be, in, you know, imperative for me to paint the picture properly. Living in a predominantly impoverished area, North Philly, where there's a church, a liquor store, and a Chinese food shop literally just about on every corner of wow. the city. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And it's... <laughs> That this very, I, I have tons of thoughts on that. But anyway, the the fact of those things, those churches that tend to collect thousands of thousands of dollars every week, right? Every week. Mm. Wow. You see the finest and the best dress, and oftentimes some of the most wealthy people in a poverty stricken community attending a particular church. But what you don't see is you don't see that money from that false doctrine, tithing being taught and pushed through peer pressure and and condemnation in other ways, spilling out into the community mm-hmm. for change. You don't see the doctrine. I'm talking about even the accurate doctrine. You see at right about, uh, I'll say right about, what, 1145, 12 o'clock, the pastor's probably in the pulpit preaching. He's at the height of his sermon right now mm, where right. people in the church are usually sweating the most, yelling the most, screaming about how God has showed up and he's showing out in that particular church. But what you don't mm-hmm. see is that same power, that same power spilling out into the community for change. You don't see right. it spill, spilling out into the families for change. The number one antidote or the number one response to a person who has a particular issue within the church, with their family or community, nine times out of ten, unfortunately, is one of the most destructive. Is simply, well, sister so-and-so, brother so-and-so, we got to pray about this thing. Right. Let's fast. Let's pray. They tend to use spiritual disciplines as a way of combating earthly issues. When they already have been endowed with a spiritual power, the Holy Spirit, to deal and address with wisdom these earthly situations. Mm-hmm. Hence why it is so dangerous. I, I would be quick to say, and this is just Big L talking, I would be quick to say that it is easy for me to help somebody as a believer outside of the institutionalized church system than it is with thousands of people. I can do more by myself on the outside with Jesus than a ton of 500 people proclaiming Jesus' name in the church can do. Because right. for whatever reason, that, that church system, bro, is dangerous. Indeed. Indeed. Wow. Are you going to say something, homie? Nah, man. I mean, I mean, it's 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 just crazy. I mean, when you, you know, when you look at the fact that you know people, um, who especially in the community who have particular needs, you may they may may even be a member of the church, and you know the first thing pastor wants to know is whether or not your tithing is up to date. You know, which would determine 
whether or not you would receive help from the church. You know, it's really mind-boggling. Um, you know, it, it, the church system, it, it's, it's really a danger. And, you know, as Elle said earlier, you know, it, it, you really don't understand how dangerous it is until you are actually on the outside of it whether it's you coming out on your own, whether you've been kicked out or whatever the case may be, you really don't understand just how dangerous it is until you're on the outside and actually looking in. You know, you get stories from people who are um, who are still in and how they're battling, you know, certain things within the church system, you know, and don't even realize, you know, that, you know, they're – that their battle could be so much easier if they were to come out. It, I have friends right now personally that, you know, they were in, they were in the same church that I was in and they, you know, they always talk about, you know, you know, we need the tithe, we need the tithe, we need the tithe, you know, and I'm not, you know, I'm not just harping on the tithing aspect of it. You know, it's just, it's just a thought right now. Um, you know, they talk about how much they tithe and how much they tithe, you know, and, it, you know, at one point, you know, the wife, she wasn't working, but now she has to work because, you know, of certain, certain circumstances. And, you know, my whole thing is that if tithing really works, why are you going back to work when you have a family of five children to take care of? You understand what I'm saying? And, you know, the church isn't helping because the church is using all the money either to maintain a building or maintain a lifestyle or both. And so, you know, when you, you know, when you look at certain, you know, certain examples of, you know, of of people who have been literally hurt, you know, by people in the pulpit, people around the pulpit, you know. Al said it earlier, you know, we wasn't just in it, you know, we were leaders perpetuating it, you know. So I saw people um, get basically mangled spiritually because they may have made one mistake. You understand what I'm saying? I've seen people um, who were... Um, you know, who were kicked out because, you know, well, she was looking at my man wrong. And this is the pastor talking. You, you understand what I'm saying? You know, over petty stuff, um, it's, it's, it's just mind-boggling how, you know, pastor will teach something that they themselves won't even adhere to at times. There was, there's, a, there's, a, there's a meme running around on Facebook right now um, you know, saying something to the effect that, you know, pastor will teach you to, you, you know, to depend on God for your needs, but they themselves won't depend on God. They'll depend on you, you know. Mm-hmm. It's, you know, this, this type of show, you know, and, you know, right now because, you know, it's such a passion for me, you know, maybe my words or my thoughts aren't coming out the way it should be, but, you know, by the end of this show, people will really understand where the danger lies within the church system. Yeah, and I've seen that happen too, man. I've seen uh, I've seen people that had a need, and, and again, this is totally foreign to Scripture, but I've seen people that had a need, and uh, rather than actually help these people is is a, a family a single mother uh, got uh four kids uh had a need went to her church that she was uh, uh attending at the time and rather than help her they sent her to all of these other organizations that the church actually for lack of a better term outsourced their uh, charitable giving to these organizations. And, and, and when I say these organizations in the community, I'm talking about stuff like, you know, uh, Helping Hand and and uh, Rescue Mission type stuff that, that uh, most cities have, right? Well, um, there were some organizations on this particular – they gave her a sheet of, of, of phone numbers to call, names of the organizations and phone numbers. She called around to all of these organizations. None of them helped in that way. What the church did, instead of vetting those organizations, they just – 
looked in the phone book and compiled some, oh, yeah, this looks like they do that type of stuff. Let's put this on the list and uh, compiled it to give to people. But they, the church themselves didn't help. So, and, and, and again, they, you know, they, they, they uh, look at your tithing record and all that type of stuff. It's just, it's just so many things about the actual institution of church that are dangerous. And that, that's something that's dangerous in the community because, again, uh, if somebody has a need, then the people, people are supposed to help people in need instead of actually concentrating all of your resources and all of your energy and all of your your time and your your talent, everything into a church body, into a church building, and then letting the leadership in that building decide who and and how much and when and where to give, that's dangerous, man, because people are still suffering regardless, regardless of, of if that building, you know, if the church building needs their lights on just so they can hold religious services every week. Uh, people are still in need, you know what I mean? And, you know, don't I, I don't want – oh, go ahead. No, go ahead, brother. Go ahead. I, I don't want the listeners to believe that there aren't good Christian organizations out there that do help people. There are a lot of good Christian organizations who are dedicated to their communities. What we're trying to say is that your particular church home should be just as dedicated. We, you shouldn't have to go to someone else's organization when your organization has the resources, has the funding um, to help you out. Mm-hmm. That's pretty yeah. much what we're saying. Yeah. And, Rob, I want to ask you this question, but caller from the 240, I see you in the queue. Right after I get finished asking Rob this question, he expounds on it. We're going to come right to you, and that's 240. We see you. Rob, when we think about the church being dangerous, and, and I specifically mentioned in the ad three areas, mm-hmm. individually, family, and community. I touched on the community aspect a little bit more, and I figure we'll deal with that a little bit more in the, as the show goes. Right, but I want will. you to kind of deal with the, the, the individual aspect, and specifically how does the church prevent or hinder one's spiritual growth? What, what are some of the ways, bro? Man, the, the, the main way to me, what jumps out right off the page at me is just because, uh, again, and this goes right back to when you, know, when you were saying how the, the church system sets itself in a place where, where it doesn't belong. Uh, it hinders your spiritual, uh, individual spiritual growth by creating uh, – a dependency on the system for your spiritual growth. So just right, th- right, right there alone, you being dependent on church leaders for your uh, understanding of scripture or your 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 uh, understanding of of prayer life and 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 everything uh, dealing with you know uh, you know cultivating your own relationship with God. You're dependent on the church system. You're dependent on these leaders to actually show you how to communicate with God or how to interpret Scripture. And what happens? See, what happens is, what happens is, on the surface, you say, "Well, what's wrong with that?" I mean, you know, if if somebody goes to church and they want to uh, learn how to pray or they or they want to, you know, read the Bible or whatever, or they want to learn Scripture. What's wrong with that? What happens is. Again, these these men, these church leaders, give you their interpretation or their idea uh, of what those things mean. They give you, they even give you their idea of what your relationship with God is supposed to look like. So that's dangerous, man. It's dangerous because it creates a lot of unnecessary bondage. It creates a lot of of, of, of religious that religious spirit, that religious mentality. And it's dangerous. It it actually clouds and muddies your your view of who Christ is and who Christ is supposed to be to you. And let me jump in there right there, Rob, because I, I get what you're saying when you say it muddies and clouds your view. But I want you to to, to to respond to this. I don't think it muddies or clouds your view. I think it gives you the wrong view and an accurate mm-hmm. yes. 
Because you don't have one view and then it changes. The church fosters a view that you actually have. So mm-hmm. it gives you the wrong one. What do you think about okay. that? I, I, yeah, I agree. I agree. Um, it actually, uh, like, like, you know, again, when you, when you have a, an unhealthy adulation towards uh, a, a pastor or a church leader or a bishop or, or whatever, you're rolling out the red carpet because your, your district bishop is coming into town and, and coming to visit your, you know what I mean? It's just, it's just why, why all of this, this adulation towards these leaders? And you, you're placing men in that position of mediator between you and God. And what you think you're doing, what you think you're doing, again, is because the system teaches it this way. You think you're serving Christ by serving these men. You think, you're pleasing, you think you're pleasing God. You think you're pleasing God by pleasing these men. And, that's the, and the system perpetuates that. The system teaches that. And it's because of men and their own desires of, of, of being kings and leaders and everything. They give you that false view of who God is and who Christ is supposed to be in your life. <laughs> and, and not only that, it, it, as well, I see you, but Dre, Dre, what's wrong with me as a Christian who attends a church praising and telling my pastor that he did a good job? What's, what's wrong with me honoring the pastor because I know how hard he's worked and put in the time, you know, to read scripture, to pray, and to deal with all these ignorant folk, what's wrong with me lifting him up and putting him on that platform? What's wrong with that? He's not, supposed, he's, he's not supposed to be lifted up. Jesus is supposed to be lifted up. Basically, what the, see, the Bible teaches us that we're supposed to be transformed into the image of Jesus Christ. Basically, what happens is, is that we're actually transforming ourselves into, into the image of our pastors instead. Yeah. And when we do, and when we transform into the image of our pastors, what basically happens is that we've taken Jesus down off the pedestal where he's supposed to be, and we placed our pastor up there instead. And mm-hmm. and now, you know, now every now everybody wants to be like the pastor. Everybody's rolling out the red carpet for the pastor. Everyone is listening to everything that the pastor says instead of listening to what Jesus said. Remember, pastors teach teach us to go out and bring people into the church. But pastors don't teach us to go out and bring people to Christ. Exactly. Mm-hmm. That's good. Call from the 240. 240, you're live on Real Talk Radio. What's your name? What's your comment? My name Black Gladiator. My comment is my comment is um, a, a long comment. So I like to say that um, this is my comment. People who say Christianity is a dangerous religion also think Islam is a terrorist religion. I like to say that people box things up. You know what I mean? Um, my my whole thing about it is, <clears throat> I understand you you saying find something that defines you, but when we look at church nowadays, they're going according to the Bible. And my my question to you is, have you ever read the Bible? Because it it seems it seems to me you haven't even touched it. Because I'm I, even though I'm playing devil's advocate for a minute, I like to say that Jesus according to a scripture, is a man. And Jesus, according to a scripture, is is basically not only a man, but a nation of men and women. You know what I mean? A black is is, a, is the black nation of men and women. So my okay, whole thing on, about bro. it... Hold on, hold on, hold on. <laughs> no, cause I, I, I want to let you get the comment. I don't believe in having those type of shows when people come and interject something different into the dialogue to change the narrative that you just blast folk and you just, you know, get rid of them. I don't like that mentality. I like to actually try to dialogue, and hopefully that the callers will stay on topic. Now, the topic of this particular show is the church it's, it's, is dangerous. It's dangerous. Not Christianity. Right. Hold on. Not Christianity, because I gave you an opportunity. Not Christianity, not mm-hmm. the fact of not reading the Bible. In your thought process, what do you have to add to the conversation in regards to the church being dangerous? Being a danger, yes. You feel what I'm saying? Right, I like to, I like to add that the, the I like to add that um, the church is dangerous. The church is dangerous, but also the church is a place of of helping. You know what I mean? The church is a place okay. of truth. When it comes to truth, you know you're held accountable with responsibility. So so on one side, the truth is you get to the, on one side is the truth is um, everyone is accepted to it. 
but on another side, everyone is held accountable to it. So my whole thing is my whole thing held is held accountable to what? Held accountable to to the truth. Everyone is held accountable to the truth. So we are held accountable. How does that happen in the church? How is that in the church? Yeah, because the church essentially is is you go and arrive and sit there and you hear a monologue. You hear one man standing there giving you information. There's actually no dialogue. And like me and you having a conversation, chopping it up, already right. understanding that we have differing viewpoints. Because I don't believe, and this is an assumption, and I apologize if I'm wrong, that you hold a same view that I hold in regards to Christ. I think we have a different point of view and a different foundation that we're arguing. We're not arguing, discussing. So we're having a dialogue, a friendly dialogue, but the church in itself doesn't permit this type. You wouldn't be able to walk into a church today, right now, at 1045, and have this type of dialogue with the pastor. There. Can, I ask a, can I ask a question? Is, can just is, respond is, to is, that, and I'll let you get your question off. You wouldn't okay. be able to have this type of dialogue, would you? Um, yeah, well, what we'll fact should we lie on to prove it? Say it again? I say, yeah, I would. I want to know what facts you were, would, what facts would you rely on to prove it? Because you can walk what? into a church today and you can have a dialogue with anyone. If you, if you well, 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 oh, right. well, you're not being honest. That, to, the facts that we're relying on is the fact that we used to be in church leadership. And I know, at least, at least for myself, we've had people that try to do exactly what we're talking about. And, you know, me personally, I've had to shut them down because, you know, they wasn't, dis- they wasn't disrupting my pastor, okay? And I've been to several church services and several churches. I've been members of several churches where, you know, that was basically my job, especially as an armor bearer. So, no, it, 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 it cannot happen. And, you know, it, it it just can't happen. So where is the basis of – because if you're basing this on one particular experience, I'm basing it on, you know, more than just one experience, knowing that this can that, – that will never be able to happen. Now, okay. Carl, I'm, I'm going to let you I'm gonna let you get the last word because I, I hope you stay on topic, though. But go ahead and get the last word, then. Okay. My, my whole thing is this. Um, Christianity is dangerous. The church is dangerous is because they want the church out of the schools. They want the churches out of the governments. They want the churches out of every out of everything. If we actually look and pay attention to what's going on around us, the church is actually being removed from a lot of things. Bruh, that's bro, that, bro, come on, man. Now listen, I, I was, I was listen. I, I'm not going to be disrespectful and just hang up on you, bro, because I think that's unnecessary. But I am going to cut you off and put you back on hold right here. But because the problem that I have with what he's saying is, the fact of the matter is, we know, and if you don't know, listeners, no one is trying to take the church out of schools. No one's trying to take the church out of homes. No one's trying to take the church, and I hope you hear me clearly on that. Specifically, no one is trying to take the church. And I think that might be the, the level of, of, of just, you know, because I think my man had a different agenda, and I'm not trying to. I don't want to attack this brother because I think that's unnecessary. But I think he had a different perspective, a different viewpoint, which made this discussion. It would have made it more difficult to continue with. But no mm-hmm. one's trying to do that. Yeah. No one's trying to take the church out of schools. The fact of the matter is the aspect when he brought up to be able to walk into a church and have this type of dialogue that we are on the panel able to have now is just not accurate. You cannot walk into Matter of fact, it can't be done. Pray, help me out. What what time, what opportunity do you as a believer have to go into a church in a room full of other believers and have a healthy dialogue about things of the faith, things of the family, things of the community? And what aspect? When can you do that? It doesn't happen, man. You, I mean, you, you know, uh, oh, I'm sorry, Dre. It, it just doesn't happen. And uh, like you were saying, it's, that's, it, it's kind of being disingenuous saying, uh, well, yeah, it, it does happen. What what facts do you have to support that? The fact is, like Dre said, we've been in the church setting before. We've been in the church system. We've been in church leadership. So we understand how that works. You can't go into any church 
I mean, if there's a church that's like that, please let us know. But you can't go into any church that's having a service that's having a one-man show with that's having a one-man monologue, a.k.a. the preacher and the sermon, and go in there and, and ask him questions about what he's, what he's preaching about. Uh, if you do that, you will be looked at as being uh, disruptive, and you will be possibly escorted out, possibly thrown out physically. Um, the only time that you can possibly have a dialogue, and it's not guaranteed even then, is what you have to do is set up a meeting with the pastor where you get to talk to him one-on-one in private not have a open and participatory dialogue in the actual assembly where it would benefit everybody to learn from that particular dialogue and that challenge of what the pastor was talking about because what we like what we're doing now is this this is like the, this is the spirit of Acts 17:11 when it's talking about the Bereans when they actually searched the scriptures and they challenged what they were learning See, in the church system, it doesn't foster that atmosphere. When you have Bible studies at church on Wednesday nights, it's called Bible study, but nine times out of ten, it's just a service, just like the rest of them. It's not like an actual Bible study where people are sitting around and chopping up the scripture. Bible study is four or five of you getting together at Starbucks or somebody's crib and sitting around the table and chopping up the scripture. But that doesn't and, you know, happen just in the to, church system. Oh, go ahead, Dre. And, and and just to add to that, even if you were in Bible study where you can have some sort of dialogue, um, not necessarily the type of dialogue that you need, but some sort of dialogue, um, the person who's running the uh, who's running the Bible study has a particular agenda and a lesson plan that he wants to get off. And mm-hmm. so you trying to raise your hand and try to go off topic. You know, they're going to try to go back to what, you know, what their lesson plan is and try to, you you know, try to shut you down as soon as possible. And so, no, you can't just go in, not even into a Bible study where you can have some sort of dialogue and try to chop it up like that. It's not going to happen. Mm -hmm. And here's, here's the aspect. And for everybody who's just tuning into the show, man, this is Real Talk Radio. You got your boy Big L, Rob, and Dre on the line. Today's topic is the church is dangerous. The call number is 661-449-9951. Press 1 if you'd like to speak to the host. The aspect of the church being dangerous that we're just touching on, the monologue aspect is just one dynamic. And the monologue aspect takes place whether it be Bible study, Sunday school, or the main church service. Here's one of the chief issues with that. It teaches you to be in a codependent relationship with the church system. It mm-hmm. teaches you that the only way that you're actually be able to hear from God is through another mouthpiece. It forces you to remain in an old covenant, Old Testament type of mentality and relationship. So when you hear people like us, who have actually chopped up and been Bereans and dialogued and wrestled with certain things of the faith, when you hear us, you're not going to be able to hear us in the spirit. And and, and I know that sounds stretchy, but what I'm saying is what you've been learned and have taken root in your spirit, you're no longer going to be able to, it's not going to come up because it goes countercultural to what you have learned and is ingrained in you in the spirit, I mean, in, from the church. So mm-hmm. here's what takes place. Right. You grew up going to church. You grew up hearing the monologue. All of a sudden, life comes through, and life does what it does to everybody. It smacks you in the face. It smacks you in the mouth. We were joking on the line before we got on the show that, you know, instead of getting Jesus on the main line, I would rather get Jesus to take care of my credit line. Like, I'd rather him get to take care of those things instead of, you know, that song. It teaches you that when you have a actual desire to change because of your own understanding of your sinfulness, it teaches you that instead of you being drawn by the Holy Spirit unto Jesus, that because in your mind Jesus and church are synonymous, you run to the church to get your life together. Instead of understanding that right there in your hungover state, in 
your after fornicating state that you can cry out to God and have that own repentance right then, right there, without anyone's assistance, and God, through the Holy Spirit, will lead you to authentic fellowship, authentic worship, to the true definition and meaning of what prayer is, to, to people who will help you read scripture. But the things that we believe and hold true here are not things that I believed and held true five or six years ago. Mm-hmm. I had a completely right. different mentality. I had a mentality that I needed church in order to be in a relationship with Christ. Right. Because mm-hmm. right. I don't know if, and, I, and caller from the 718, I see you in the queue. I'm coming right up to you right after this statement. It, it would be the equivalent of you have a friend or you know somebody and you're interested in another, you're interested in this woman, and someone has a relationship with this woman or knows some information about this particular woman. So you go to this person and say, hey, I'm interested in this woman, yada, yada, yada. You know, what do you know about this woman? And they give you information that might be helpful to get your understanding of who this woman that you're interested in. But what happens is that person remains in the midst of your relationship that you're now developing with this woman throughout eternity. So this person that you got the information about this woman for is always there, even in the most intimate of times. They're there. So you're never able to have an authentic, actual relationship with this woman because the person who gave you the information about the woman is refusing to move out of the way, and you are unable to get that person out of the way because you feel as though if you get that person out of the way, you're not able to have an actual relationship with the woman. You think the two are intertwined, that they're connected. In real life, no one would be in a relationship like that. No one would want to keep that person in that position. So when you go to be engaged intimately with your newfound wife, that that person is there all the time. But what the church says, in in many Christian instances, you have this mentality, this belief system, that you've got to have that thing in the place, that you cannot know Jesus without the church. So you are dependent upon that person, that church, for every single thing. Everything. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Every That's a great thing analogy. Everything that you need. Everything. 718, I'm going to take this caller. 718, 718, you're live on Real Talk Radio. What's your name and what's your comment? Um, my name is Irene. I'm calling from the Bronx. Good morning, Irene. Um, what's on your mind? Sorry. Okay, good morning. Um, What's on your mind? I'm sorry. I just want to say that um, as far as um, what you all were talking about, having a dialogue with the pastor or apostle, whoever it is, that's not so. Because the church that I came out of, even when he lets the different leaders get up and um, teach, or even when they had a... um, a conference, they would write out what they were going to teach on, and he would look look at it. So the the teachers and the leaders in that church sound just like him. Mm. Okay. And he would uh, walk, and he would get up there and say that I'm the set man in this house. And what does that mean? That means that, you know, whatever you have to say, it doesn't really mean anything. It's what I say no, and what no. I do. And, and how church, do you feel about that, though? You know what I mean? What, what, what type of feeling? Because as you're growing in the faith, that had to make you feel some type of way. Um, eventually, I, ha- I left. But <laughs> the point is that um, first of all, it, when you're in those type of settings, and I've seen it because, you know, I was like literally brought up in church. But mm-hmm. first of all, it emasculates the man. Most mm. of those churches. Uh-oh. Okay. Well, uh, 
because when <laughs> I remember my husband, he passed. Mm-hmm. But we were in, um, at that time, when he was living, I was going to a Kojic church. Mm-hmm. And, you know, of course, they kept him busy, blah, blah, blah. So <laughs> one time he left to go do something with the pastor. And I told him before he left, I said, don't go out there and stay out there all day long. And he, he went back and told the pastor what I said. Oh, geez. But there's no, you know, as far as the church harming us, there's no balance in the church. Um, and as far as us growing, it's not meant for us to grow. Not in that building at, at any rate. Mm-hmm. Because it's always... It, those of us that go to church is always every time you get in the building is always something that you didn't do right or you didn't do this right and that's why this didn't come out like this and that's why that didn't come out like that and look at me because I'm doing A B C and so you must not something you have left out and then gradually it came to me no it's not you it's what they teach it. So I don't, the people that, and I have a friend, she's still, you know, she's determined that she's going to stay in that system. But I don't say anything to people about whether they go to church or not. That's their own personal thing. Sure. But she says to me, when I say, when I, here and there, I'll throw in something, call me and say something. I said, well, you didn't, you know, like you didn't catch on yet? I said, that's everywhere. Oh, and then one time she told me that I was just rebellious. But, you know, I just laugh and, you know. But it's not, whoever thinks that the church system is meant for them to grow, they don't want you to grow. They got you there for a specific purpose, to fill that purpose. But as far as you growing and maturing, mm -mm, you'll never Because they'll always find something else that you didn't do or you didn't complete or that's why this didn't come out and that didn't come out and you didn't do this. Mm -hmm. Right, so we thank you for the call and your comment. We're going to meet your line and hopefully you hang out with us for a little while longer. It's It's just diabolical, man. I mean, literally diabolical to think about how the church does the things that it does to people, man. And I know it can be very, very dangerous, Rob. Uh, mm. It can be rough, bro. And I don't think that people understand how rough it is. And I think sometimes when they hear shows and discussions like this, uh, they think that we're just basically using things off of personal experiences. Like, we're just angry, frustrated folks who feel as though, you know, this is our get-back moment. This is the way mm-hmm. for us to kind of take shots at church. No, right. this is us holding up a accurate sign of what's taking place in there and putting it in its proper context biblically. That's, mm-hmm. that's the, the, the key for us, for people to understand. And as you're listening, mm-hmm. listeners, this is Real Talk Radio, with your boy Big L and Rob and Dre, and then the topic is the church is dangerous. And again, the calling number is six six one four four nine 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 five one. Press one if you want to talk to the host. Nine one nine four zero eight. I see you in the queue. We're going to come right to you. Uh, but just understanding that this thing impedes and hinders your growth, man. It, it gets in the way. And you know what it's like. Every year, right around New Year's, we know that the church comes up with a new slogan for the mm-hmm. year. Right. They come up with a new catchphrase for the year. And it's usually something that they feel like they're going to be teaching upon throughout the year. If you were a gardener, and you garden, you got your soil, you got your water, and crops are growing up, you know, every year you would not go and redig that stuff up, particularly if the crops is growing strong. Mm-hmm. You would just till the soil. 
you would just get rid of the weeds in the soil. You would put some stuff in the soil to keep the, the things that are attacking those crops in the soil. You would not just overhaul the whole thing if it's growing properly. Right. So obviously, when they do this type of thing every year and they come up with this new thing and they beat you in the head with condemnation and judgment and all these types of things, they're showing you that your walk is not proper, mm-hmm. that something is going on, something is off. So that should lead you, the believer, to ask, what is going on? To actually take a full examination and assessment of your own spiritual life and to find out, okay, I'm not growing spiritually. But then that's a problem in and of itself because their definition of what it means to grow spiritually or to spiritual growth is going right. to be based off of... <laughs> I'm going to take the caller, bro. 919... <laughs> 919-408, you're live on Real Talk Radio. What's your name? What's your comment? Hey, this is uh, Southeast Vance here. Hey, can you guys hear me? Yeah, what's yes, up, sir, bro? We hear you loud and clear. Good morning. <laughs> how you, how you guys doing? Oh, my goodness. You all are hitting on a very uh, strong topic with me because uh, the when I saw the name of you all's program today, I said, oh, man, they're going to get this thing on the, on the head today. Because uh, basically what uh, the title sums everything up in a nutshell, that the church is dangerous. Um, I, I remember when uh, I first started going to this church here in uh, Durham, North Carolina, uh, they would tell us you have to be the church every time the doors are open. You know, every time the doors are open, you need to be here because God got something to tell you and, you know, yada, yada. And I got hooked up to that thing. And, if you miss church, you know, people are like, well, well, we didn't see you at church today. Why, why were you at church? Why, you know, uh, you don't, don't you love God? You know, <laughs> and um, right. it, 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 it brings to uh, mind a certain incident uh, some years ago, uh, maybe about 10 years ago when I was in a church. Um, it was around, I think it was either Memorial Day or Labor Day. And you know how people like to go out with their families and they like to, you know, have a cookout, and, you know, spend time with their families, have fun, you know, toss a frisbee around or whatever they do. And uh, this was a Sunday before that holiday, and the pastor gets up and he says, okay, I know you all want to go out with your cookouts and everything tomorrow, but we're going to have prayer service tomorrow. Now, you need to be at prayer service. And he said, you, know, uh, you go out there, have your cookouts and everything, but make sure you cut those cookouts and enough time to come to the prayer service. And then he said a statement that I, oh my goodness. He said, if you don't come to the service tomorrow, may you choke on your hamburger. <laughs> and at that, at that time, you know, I was still within the church, you know, system and everything. And I was like, man, I don't want to choke on my hamburger. I'm going to go through the, you know, but now you know, they tell you that hindsight is twenty twenty. And when you look back at it, you you like, oh, my goodness, you know, I actually fell for that, you know. And that's the control that a lot of these preachers have over their congregations in the church. They tell you uh, we're going to have a revival uh, tonight, and we're going to have a week-long revival uh, every night this weekend. You need to be there, you know. And you come there, and it's just a bunch of hollering, you know. Uh, They take a lot of time telling you how much you need to give and uh, basically what a revival is is a money-raising racket. That's basically what a revival is. In my experience, you know, that, that, that's basically what a revival is. And mm-hmm. But they'll sit there, they'll preach into the night, 10, 11, 12 o'clock into the night, and they tell you, you need to go, you need to be here. I know you need to go to work. And they'll throw the scripture out at you saying that, uh, I know some of you all are concerned about going to work, but you need to be at this revival. And they'll throw the scripture that says, uh, uh, it's the same spirit that raised Christ from the dead dwells in you. He'll quicken your mortal body. So you need to come to the service. But when you go to work, wow. you know, like eight hours of sleep. I, folks, I'm not making this up. <laughs> but this is what goes on. And you, thank you all for being so on topic with this thing today. We appreciate it, brother. Thank you, as always, for tuning in, man. Thanks, man. Yeah. And I don't think, and again, at this time, callers, feel free to call in. 
the number is 661-449-9951. Press 1 to speak to either, you know, either one of these brothers on the panel to address this topic, the church is dangerous. Uh, a bold and provocative statement, but nonetheless uh, a statement that needs to be said. I know in the middle of the show or on the show, one of the things that we're really cautious of, Ralph, is, is uh, not trying to be the Holy Spirit for people. Mm-hmm. We just want to present information for people that hopefully people study and research for themselves to come up to particular conclusions. But when it right. comes to the church, and I'm really leery of telling people not to go anywhere. And when I say mm-hmm. anywhere, I mean anywhere because I believe in people's personal choice and freedom to do what they in themselves decide to do, whether it's good, bad, or ugly, is their personal choice. But I think it's every believer's responsibility to warn people of danger. It's, it's our responsibility to warn them of any form of danger that is coming their way or they may be involved in. Right. If you are in a church, I'm warning you that where you are is dangerous. And mm-hmm. your choice to stay or go is up to you. I'm warning you. That's a dangerous yeah. place for you to go. That's a yeah. dangerous place for you to be. That's a dangerous place for you to continue to attend. That's a dangerous place for you to invite other people to go. Particularly, and this aspect is one that uh, Sister Marlene just mentioned that I just think is so prevalent and I think is one that people don't realize or pay a whole lot of attention to is it's not a little place. The church is not a place for people who are coming out of or are in abusive relationships. It's, mm-hmm. it's, it's not a place because it gives you a false sense of security. And in that security, what you're actually going into is a, another abusive environment. Another right. form of abuse is taking place. Now, how are you being abused? One of the things that you lose when you become a member of a church, Rob, is control. You lose control of your life, essentially. When you become a member, you lose control of your spiritual life. Mm-hmm. You yeah, lose you, you. You surrender it, you know what I mean? You, it's almost like you just give it up, really, to be honest with you. So, um, I mean, wow. Either way, man, sometimes it's, sometimes it's voluntary, sometimes it's involuntary due to, due to like, abuses and stuff that go on inside these uh, inside these uh, churches, man. And, and just like uh, Elle said, man, we're not telling you not to go because that's a, a decision that you have to make, but we are saying that the that the, where you're going is dangerous because it, it is part of the institution. The institution itself is what uh, is not God's design. It's like, you know, a couple of weeks ago we were talking about it that I had to correct myself, how we used to say the institutional church system is broken. It's not broken. It's, it's wrong out the gate. It's not something that uh, that God des- designed. And when you have a understanding of church history, a lot of a lot of this stuff will mm-hmm. will come into focus. You really have to do a, a, a really open minded, objective study of church history, and you will understand that uh, a lot of stuff that is done in these churches is unnecessary. So if it's unnecessary, why go? Exactly, exactly. Why even go? And you, so you, you just brought up another danger, Rob. If mm-hmm. you begin to, you can't, it's like you can't study church while being in the church because right. everything that is connected to it is, it, it, it's, it's coming out of it. So to get an accurate understanding of what it is in the church history, like the, the, the different councils, how mm-hmm. scripture was canonized, Mm -hmm. Um, how different denominations were put in place, you know, you have to be able to step out of it to have an objective view because Mm -hmm. everyone who is connected to it has a vested interest in it. Wow. See, there you go. And just like Dre alluded to it earlier, man, and we say this so often on the show if you pay attention, you will be able to see 
things objectively with a clarity that you just cannot achieve when you're inside the system. You just don't have it. And it's not, we're not bragging like we've achieved some type of superior mental state or spiritual, uh, uh, you know, we're not, we're not good. God, we're not (laughs) bragging seriously. Cause you know, you talk to any of us, we're just regular dudes. We got bills to pay. We got struggles and all this, that, and the third, we're not, we're not putting ourselves on a pedestal. But it is just a fact. It's just a fact of life that you won't see things uh, clearly until you get out of the system. When you when you step outside of the church system, you will begin to look back and see stuff with a clarity that you just did not have. You can't you can't see things while you're you're actually inside it, being clouded by it because your judgment and your 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 outlook on things are being clouded by the system. And that's why it's in, it's innately dangerous just because of that. And, and um, even even these assemblies, even a lot of these assemblies that pride themselves on being uh, biblically sound, and 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 what they teach is so expository. And we go line by line and precept upon precept, and uh, we study scripture. Uh, uh, in, in a in a very thorough and and contextually accurate fashion, okay, you could do that on your own. I mean, th- that's why we say we're not telling you not to go. It's good to, to to get that experience, but you could do that on your own. But but what you're guaranteed to get, even in those assemblies that pride themselves on being biblically accurate, is you're still going to get the institutional church mindset. It's going to manifest itself somehow some way, shape, or form, that institutional church mindset, that, that pharisaical spirit, that, that it's going to manifest itself somehow. And w- whether or not it's the leader uh, uh, putting himself on a pedestal and, and making himself to be some type of person with some authority that he just does not have, or just uh, the fact that even though that's an assembly that prides itself on being biblically uh, sound until it comes to church attendance. Now they're making that mandatory. Now some somehow you have to be in church every Sunday. That's not scripturally accurate. Fellowship is, but you could do that on your own. You could do that anywhere. You don't have to be a member of a particular body to be in right standing with Christ. It's just it just doesn't work that way. Again, ladies and gentlemen, the call in number is 661-449-9951. Press 1 if you have a question, comment, criticism, or concern. Uh, the topic is the church is dangerous. Just, it always, topics like this always takes me to a, a kind of a a solemn uh, place, man, where it's really vexing to me because, I know that there are going to be people who are going to literally avoid this topic because within them their cognitive dissonance is so strong mm-hmm. that they're going to refuse to hear the truth in this, that they're literally going to talk themselves out of this. Mm-hmm. They're literally going to, because of the cognitive dissonance, because of the conditioning that is taking place, they will refuse to ask themselves what I think are very pertinent and important questions that every believer in and outside of the church should ask themselves. And the questions are such as, what is motivating me to do what I am doing? Mm-hmm. When I get up to attend a church service, why am I going here? Important but I think that's one yep. of the, the problems with it is, is the fact of, you know, for whatever reason, people refuse to have honest dialogue with themselves and other people. But ask yourself, why am I going here? Mm-hmm. And do does it fall in line with what Scripture says? Mm-hmm. And unfortunately, church culture supersedes Scripture. Church mm-hmm. culture supersedes what Scripture says. Yep. Church supersedes what Scripture teaches. Church supersedes what scripture is explicit explicit to tell you to do and not do. Church supersedes all those things. And if mm. you don't believe me, I can give you 1,900 different examples. And the one big example that I can always tell you is what you see today as a church was never God's idea. It was never mm. God's design. It was not God's creation. And I saw an outstanding meme 
that showed the Tower of Babel, and on the Tower of Babel had all these different denominations upon it. Like right. each level of this tower was a different denomination. And I thought that that was a wonderful depiction of what church is, what the church system is. It's a Tower right. of Babel. It's either the Tower of Babel or it's a throne seat, or it's an attempt of them trying to sit in a throne seat. Mm-hmm. Each one of these things are incredibly detrimental and dangerous. It robs you of your sense of self. When you get to a point where you identify with anything, anything more than you identify with the actual creator and author of your faith, that's a problem. Right. Right. Wow. Mm. That's deep, man. I mean, um, like you said, that that uh, that meme is, is very uh, that's been floating around with that that Tower of Babel. Um, it, and I actually I posted it on my page and just I was like, just discuss this on your own. I was like, get, what uh, feeling does this give you? Does this uh, anger you? Does it cause make, cause you to ask questions? Does it make you feel some type of way? I mean. Uh, describe what you feel. No judgment zone. Everybody, you know, just give your your thoughts or whatever. This isn't a, a bash anybody type of type of party. And um, eventually, it did spark some uh, some. Uh, I don't want to say heated. I, I don't know if that's the word I'm looking for, but it sparked some some spirited conversation. Um, what I think happened was, like you said, L, just like how this topic um, is a. Uh, is a, a kind of a figurative poke in the eye when you say that the church is dangerous. It's, it's kind of a poke in the eye to some people. It's like, wait, what? Um, I think that meme, because it listed so many very popular denominations. I mean, just think of a, a popular denomination, and that was listed on that meme um, symbolically as a Tower of Babel, right? Um, yeah. It's... Uh, it, it there was some spirited, you know, uh, debate on that because of that cognitive dissonance, because of that that uh, that poke in the eye, that that uh, that thing that causes one to actually say, "Hmm, I know that something about this seems is is probably right. I just don't know how to articulate it, and and, and I'm kind of scared of it, you know." Um, and it's just, man, it's just, I got so many thoughts about it, man. It's just like, just like today, for example, today, because we're talking about, you know, that, that the bondage that, that's in the system. Today here in Durham, North Carolina, man, it's very uh, uh, gloomy today. It's kind of cloudy. It's first day of spring, and it's it's it's, it's, it's really, uh, uh, the weather is kind of nasty. You know, it's, it's rainy off and on. And this is like a, a day that a lot of people would choose to stay in, in, inside. Um, but you might have somebody, some pastor getting in the pulpit saying, you know, they'll, they'll say stuff like, well, you know, I'm glad, I'm glad, you know, the rain didn't stop y'all. The rain didn't stop y'all from coming in. The rain didn't stop you. You know, you came to church anyway. It's cloudy outside, but you came to church anyway. But you you got to understand that God is not tripping if you decide to stay inside and rest on a particular Sunday, no matter what the weather is. It's, it's not, you, you're not a heathen because, oh, Lord, it's cloudy. I think I need to make that extra push to go to church. No, I can look up and down my my uh, Facebook timeline and people will be like, I didn't want to go to church this morning, but I got up and pressed on anyhow. See, first of all, there's your reward because you on, you know, you're on Facebook bragging about you got up and went, went to church. So there's that. But if you decided to stay home and chill and just, you know, read the scripture and pray on your own, do you think God is upset that you didn't go to church? So when L was saying you have to really check your motives in so many words, you really have to uh, check your motive as far as w- what is motivating you to uh, attend these, these assemblies, to attend church or to, to do anything inside the church system. What is your motivation? Is your motivation uh, to go, is that based upon what somebody thinks about you? What is that? Is that motivation based on what somebody might say if you decide to stay home and kick your feet up and chill and watch uh, basketball all day today? You think somebody? If you think somebody is going to say something 
to you. I mean, you got to really look deep inside yourself. Don't think God, I'm telling you, God is not tripping about you not uh, going to church. He really is not. It's about your relationship with him, and, and the building has nothing to do with your relationship with God. So really, are you performing for other people? Are you going to church because you're going to be seen at church, even though it's a cloudy day, you press your way on because the rain couldn't stop you, you extra spiritual because it's rainy, and you went to church anyway? Any other day, you would be saying, man, this is a good day to stay home and call out of work. You understand? I Bro. hope people understand what I'm – I really hope people understand the heart of what we're trying to say. You know, we ain't trying to – like Elle said, we're not trying to tell you not to go. But what is your motivation, though? What's your motivation? Are, seriously, are you performing for other people or are you upset, Are you uh, scared of upsetting God? Because, again, God is much bigger than that. You got We got to take God out of this box. God is much bigger yeah. than that. God is not petty. God is not going to judge you for not going to church this morning. And it's and it's thing, man. I'm so frustrated with topic like this because mm-hmm. it's like people that I know should be hearing this topic won't hear. Right. It's, it's, it, they 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 won't grasp what we're saying. And two one four, I see you in the queue, and I'm gonna get right to you. But I want to mention this today in the church system. It's Palm Sunday. Mm-hmm. Today is Palm Sunday, and what many people call and deem as Easter Sunday is next Sunday. This is how dangerous the church is. It will take a absolute, clear, false doctrine and turn it into a recruiting drive. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. They'll take something that it is absolutely, unequivocally, clear cut that it's a false doctrine and false mm-hmm. teaching and flip it and put a new name on it, call it Resurrection Day, in right. order to get you to come. Because, mm-hmm. you know, the last thing we want to say is, man, we just have a regular old service today. We ain't involved in, you know, that, that that pagan foolishness called Easter. We, we know that ain't got nothing to do with Jesus. So what right. we do is because we know that's the day that people are going to come to church anyway. We want everybody to come and be involved. We just want to change the name of that falsehood, use the same context, mm-hmm. just to have people come. Just to have people show up. Yep. And because traditionally, if you if you really uh, pay attention, numbers normally increase uh, as far as membership uh, after Easter. Easter and New Year's are, are key times where membership uh, numbers jump in these churches. Because, like like El said, it is it's uh, kind of a recruiting thing. But but as far as Easter, <laughs> wait a minute, what? Somebody's listening, like, wait, what? Wait, first of all, these these cats saying that the church is dangerous. Then they saying Easter is false doctrine. We've done it. We've done a show one day. We've done, I think we've done a couple of shows dealing with that. So you know, hit us up in the archives. Go do a search on uh, for Real Talk Radio on YouTube. You'll find that show. But um, I agree with everything El just said. Um, they take a, you know, a a false doctrine, flip it, try to be try to be somewhat, you know, paint themselves as being somewhat uh accurate, biblically biblically accurate and call it resurrection Sunday and still have people show up in droves. And in the in, in the tradition, man, wow. So many people are gonna show up. They're gonna show up dressed, you know, in in their best, in their Sunday best per se. And uh it's just another Another tool to get people to 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 come on that particular day. Hopefully, join the church, start bringing money in. Uh, you know what I mean? And man, man. And the thing is, Rob, we 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 go to the recruiting, we go to the money aspect, and yeah, we know there are many of these uh, lying behind pastors who are going to manipulate people into do those things. But then let's go to the other side of the coin of the same people who are within this system, the pastors who are going to use this opportunity to actually attempt to 
give people the gospel. They're going to they're going to still operate under a false pretense. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and use it. So so essentially, and what they don't realize is, and I think actually, I'm sorry, what they actually realize is they're using a lie, something that is absolutely false and has absolutely no connection with actual biblical Christianity to draw people in to give them biblical Christianity. Mm -hmm. And in some way, they are actually convincing themselves that that is okay. Like, right. listen, it is, it is mind-blowing. And this, the sad part about it, this is the only relationship. This is the only situation that this is okay. You wouldn't be involved with any a, a female who came at you with this false pretense. Right. What was the right. one movie that, uh, or the one, there's a comedy bit or a movie where the guy meets the attractive woman and when he gets her back to the crib, that she starts peeling off these all these different things from the weave to the eyes oh, uh, to, <laughs> to the butt pads and all these different things. I'm going to get and, you. And then struggling. she has the nerve to say, "Well, you still you still love me, don't you?" Right. <laughs> it's the, it's the same sort of mentality. You exactly. use all these gimmicks and tricks. To, let me tell you the truth, family. Because I know in the churches in this area, bro, they're handing out palms. Actually, mm-hmm. palm leaves. There are people that's going to come home with palm leaves. Who will take right. these palm leaves, bring them home, and actually put these palm leaves in the in water, which shows actually there's they don't have a fundamental understanding of you know <laughs> of gardening or anything like that anyway. Because you put that palm tree, that palm leaf, in water, it's not going to grow. You can't grab a right. leaf off the dog on ground, put it in some dog on water, and expect the dog on leaf to grow. There's nothing. It's not going to happen that way. But these people are giving these leaves, bro, with the intent and thought process, bro, that there's some spiritual significance behind that palm leaf. Mm. So these people wow. are holding on to these dog on things, bro. And then on next week, they're going to school, they're going to church where there's going to be an Easter bunny, where there's going to be a bunny passing out eggs <laughs> and candy. Mm-hmm. But the church is, is is very smart and and deceptively, and when I say smart, I'm not giving them praise. I'm saying they understand that during the summer months, and it's that leadership aspect coming again. If you've been in leadership within the church, what happens during the summertime? The numbers do what? Yep, they go down. Church numbers yep. go down in the summertime because people are doing things with family. So what happens then? It becomes incredibly difficult for them to do what? Pay the pastor? Pay the bills? Mm-hmm. Uh oh. Keep the doors open? So that's where that monetary aspect comes in. So what happens after the next holiday of Easter? What's the next big holiday that they focus on? Mother's Day. Yep. Why do they focus on Mother's Day? Because for one, who are the dominant participants within the church system? Women. Females. Yep. yep. Everybody knows that if females are going to do whatever they can to get particular people that they've been trying to get to go to church all year long, they're going to try to do whatever they can. Well, it's Mother's Day. That's the least you can do is come to church with you. And at that point in time, your pastor, nine times out of ten, is going to give you some feministic, female-driven sermon with a little bit of Jesus sprinkled on top. Exactly. But no one wants to call out and say how dangerous that type of thought process and teaching is. It propagates false. It, it gives out false doctrine every dog on week, Rod. Yes, it does, bro. Hmm. It's amazing, man. It's simply amazing. And, um, again, what we're setting out to do is, because uh, I know people, oh, they did Oh, they bashing the church. Oh, they they church hurt. Oh man, this that like you said earlier. They, this is their get back. No, again, it's because we have we have a heart for the people. We have a heart for the people. We have a heart for the people that e- even the ones that say stuff like, "Oh, y'all are church hurt. Y'all just bashing and y'all are rebellious and y'all need to get somewhere and sit down. Y'all need to get somewhere and sit down under some leadership. Blah 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 blah. But y'all need to get back in the church. We have a heart for the people that say all that stuff too, and we hear it all the time. Um, 
but it's just it's just a lot of unfounded assumption because you just you, it's easy it's easy to run to that type of stuff to try to justify why you're not thinking about anything that we're saying and what we're doing is again trying to to get people to understand uh that it's about the p it's about the people it's about the people we're trying to help the people because we have a love for the people it's not uh blasphemous or heretical to talk against the institutional church system. It's just not because it, it is a system. It's just like, you know, John points this out a lot. It's a part of the world system. If you really think of it, I mean, we, you know, <laughs> this is, this could lead down to another half hour that we just don't have today to discuss it. But when you really uh, think about uh, church history and when you really think about uh, the institutional church system, where it comes from, what it really is and what it really is not. It's a part of the world system. It's not part of God's design. So we're, it's not, we're not uh, being rebellious or blasphemous or heretical by talking against the church system. It's because we have a love for the people. The true church, the true church, we make the statements that we make, that we say that the church is dangerous. We know it's a poke in the eye of people that really can't see because they're they're actually being blinded by the system itself. We realize that. But it's because of our love for the people that we say these, these things. And I wish they would grasp it. I mean, that would be right. my prayer for them to grasp it. I don't even need you to just to come through and listen to the show and say, hey, what, what Big L, Rob, and Dre said today, man, was actually true. I don't, I don't need that type of validation or approval. What I need and want to see people do is actually ask themselves the difficult questions. Because here's one of the big problems, man. Folks are not able to see the dangers of what they're in. So there are going to be people who are going to go to church today, man, and go and feel like, you know, they heard a great word. They heard some emotional-driven emotionally manipulative singing to have a sprinkle of Jesus on it. They gave a couple of dollars to probably a, you know, a particular charity along with their tithes. You know, their offering actually probably went to maybe a local high school, but they feel like they've done something. They've seen somebody they haven't seen in a long time, so they were able to reconnect, and they're going to attribute all of those things to the church and feel like none of those things are possible without that particular mechanism. And that's where the issue becomes. They feel as though, and they are trained, conditioned, manipulated, guilted, condemned, judged, into believing and feeling, grasping, and growing in this thought process that they cannot have a healthy relationship with Christ without this particular system. That's idolatry all the way around. Mm-hmm. Yep, and that's something we didn't really touch on that that aspect. We we kind we kind of alluded to it a little bit, but but it, it's idolatry. It breeds idolatry. The church system breeds idolatry. Whether it's idolatry of the system itself, because we, man, listen, we I know people that revere their church buildings like it is a spiritual entity. I knew, matter of fact, I, I might have told this story once before, but I know the sister, man. I know the sister that her car actually broke down in the church parking lot, right? And it stayed there for actually weeks, man, because, you know, right around the same time, I mean, she was going through it, right around the same time she lost her job. She really didn't have money to get a, her car uh, towed and repaired. Stayed in the church parking lot for several weeks. She finally got it towed to a mechanic who was real shady, um, hit her with a bunch of uh, exorbitant charges for fixing stuff that probably didn't need to be fixed, that, that, you know, fixed the problem but went, you know, above and beyond what he was required to do just to get more money out of this sister. And you know what she said, bro? She said, <laughs> she said, I should have just left my car on holy ground. Well, leaving your car, it was already there for several weeks, and it still didn't fix itself. So 
So that should let you know right there that there's nothing spiritual and holy about none of these church buildings. That's just somebody, that's somebody that, again, that's an example of somebody totally blinded by the system, man. So it, it is idolatry of the buildings itself, the system itself, or more commonly, the men that have put themselves up as leaders, and women too, that have put themselves up as, 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 as religious leaders. Like I said, depending on what denomination you're in, you, you got your local pastor, then you got uh, 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 a bishop. uh, di- mm-hmm. district bishop or, or regional bishop or whatever, and when they come to town, oh, my God, red carpet, uh, <laughs> you might as well be sprinkling rose petals like uh, it's coming to America. But that's the mentality. I mean, that's, that's the type of, of mentality they have when these people come into town. They ro- they roll out the figurative red carpet, maybe literal in some cases, and they just go above and beyond. These are just men. These are just men that, that woke up and they had to go to the bathroom just like you did this morning. They had to take a shower, get dressed just like you did. These are men. Nothing special about them, except they just got a religious title in front of their name. It's that same institutional uh, church mindset. It's that same pharisaical spirit that Jesus dealt with in his time. Understand that Jesus wasn't about all of this pomp and circumstance. And this lets you know that people aren't really reading the scripture, and they don't, or, or, or more importantly, they just don't understand who Jesus is and what Jesus accomplished, what Jesus did for us. You understand? So that allows that type of, of, of mentality to breed itself, that type of idolatry to breed because you don't understand who Jesus was. If you understood that Jesus wasn't about all of this foolishness, then it, that alone should just, like, you know, be a light bulb. So, like you said, man, just, just to hit that idolatry aspect, man, it, it breeds, the system breeds idolatry. It just simply does. It's amazing that you'll have an institution that will constantly and consistently blast every other possible sin Ignoring the major one that they perpetuate every Sunday, which would be idolatry. Exactly. It's it's amazing. We got a caller, man, 979. We're going to take this caller, and then I think we're probably going to end up landing this joint, man. So 979, 979, you're live with Real Talk Radio. What's your name? What's your comment? Uh, my name is Anna. Hello, Good morning. Anna. Hi. Good morning. I just dropped my mom off at a Koji church. <laughs> oh, I'm so and I'm on my way to go back. Yeah, I'm going to get the final March Madness. But anyway, it's another story. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I am a believer, and you know what? I, you guys are so on point. Uh, I walk out of an institutionalized church, and I see church on on Easter Day about eight years ago. Happy because I just, <laughs> I'm telling you, I had had enough. Um, the, the, you know, they got up with the usual, um, you know, the horrible, the plays, with the horrible oh, acting, the mimes. I just oh, want to drown God. a mime. I'm just sorry. And it, it, I just couldn't take no more. I, I just got up and left. I, I said, this is it for me. But what I really wanted to tell you guys about was yesterday, I was in Ross, and so this lady was in there. I know you got to wrap it up real fast because I can talk real fast. And this is a lady in there, African-American lady in there, and so she was over in the home goods section, and so she was looking uh, at these little little uh, boxes, you know, these little decorator boxes which you store things in. And, you know, women, we like that kind of stuff. I think they call them nesting boxes. So she was asking me, she's which one of the two do I, she said, I can't decide on which one to get. And so I picked out, I said, I think this one is the better. So she says, oh, thank you. She said, I'm getting this as a gift for our first lady. I said, oh, I said, what is she, birthday or something? No, we're just getting it because the first lady is such a great person. She's such an outstanding, mean, she just went on and on and on. And I, you know, I just let her get through with her laundry list of how great the first lady is. And I said, you know what? I said, that's nice that you want to honor your first lady. I said, but you know what? I said, I bet that list that you just told me, I said, I bet you are just as great. 
and you're just as good, mm. and you're just as kind, and you're just you're a good mm. mom, and you're a good wife, and, and on and on and on. And I said, you know why I know that? And she says, why? I said, because you wouldn't be standing here right now trying to buy this lady a gift if you didn't have a, a caring heart. I said, so this box that you're going to get her, I said, you can't decide on which two. Get the other one for you because you're a good person, too. And she says, you know, you're right. I am a good person. Yeah. Yeah, get you one, too. But see, it's, it's the mentality like you guys have been saying. It, it, it's, a, it's almost a cult-like brainwashing. And it's in all of them. It's the system. It is the system. And, yeah, there may be some pastors out there who really, like you guys, when you guys were pastors, you, you meant well, but it's the system. That you're in, we're in, yep, or we're yep. in. Mm-hmm. So that's all Absolutely. I wanted to say. So I'm going to hang up, and I'm going to go turn TV on in a few minutes. All right. So, enjoy, enjoy yourself. Enjoy yourself, sis. Thank you for calling. Hey, we got one more, man. I think 214 is back. Uh, okay. 214, you're live on the air. What's your name? What's your comment? Hello. My name is Rhonda Phillips. How are you? Good morning, oh, Rhonda. 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 How can we help you? Hey, um, I was – two things. I was thinking about uh, the sister who left her uh, car on the parking lot for two weeks <laughs> and uh, and went to the shade tree. If it were a real church, then Uh-oh. surely if a car was in, well, at my former church, it would have got towed after two days. <laughs> right. But well. if it was a real church and a car was sitting there for two weeks, why wouldn't one of the brothers or – Somebody mm. That's all I'm saying about that. But um, wow. one of the things, my son and I were having uh, lunch on Friday, and I was talking to him about um, being highly opinionated and highly intelligent, which leads to manipulation, and mm, why his mm, relationships mm. were all kind of screwy. But he's 23. But, you know, mm-hmm. I try. I just talk to him. So <laughs> after we got through eating, we walked through the door, and um, going to the car a young lady um, was parked right next to me. She came out of the nail salon. We came out of Dickie's. So she said, she turned and looked at me, and she said, hello. And I said, hi, how are you? And I uh, started walking to my car. She said, excuse me. And I said, yes. And she said, I want you to come to my church on Sunday. Oh, boy. I said, okay. Look, I said, okay. <laughs> and she said, um, well, it's over in Pleasant Grove. She said, uh, so it's not too far from here. I said, Okay. And she said, um, because I go to a phenomenal church, the pastor is awesome. She said, whatever you need. She said, wait, I got a card for you. And I looked over at my son, and his face was twisted. Um, So, you know, it's okay. Um, I uh, got the card from her, and she says, it's a phone number on there for my pastor. Whatever you need, whether it's prayer, whether you need finances, you know, whether you're sick or whatever you need, just call him. He'll talk to you about anything. And I said to her, okay. And uh, then she said, okay, well, are you going to come to church? I said, mm, I don't know. I might. Um, and she said, okay, well, I hope to see you. And I said, oh, okay. And so I turned back to my car, and my son said, why didn't you tell her? And I said, because, you know, she was telling me some stuff, and I just wanted to have a conversation with her. And he mm-hmm. said, but, Ma, you are licensed, ordained, evangelized. Mm-hmm. You could have told her you don't need to go to church. You've been in church all your life. I've been in church all my life. I said, but she didn't ask me. I said, mm-hmm. what she's doing is repeating what her pastor told her to do. I said, mm-hmm. she has no understanding of spirituality. She just sees church as church. And mm-hmm. she thinks, you know, she doesn't even realize that if I were to die today, if I was, you know, if I don't know how she perceived me, I had on, you know, my, um, I just had on regular clothes and, you know, my natural hair just out, just chilling. I said, I don't know. She didn't ask me, did I know Jesus as my Savior? She didn't ask me anything. All mm-hmm. she wants me to do is come, come to, to church. church. Wow. I said, and that's dangerous because if I were not saved, you know, and filled and I didn't know what I know, that did nothing for me. And at the mm-hmm. end of the day, I'm still lost because the wow. message of the church is not, you know, salvation. The message of the church mm-hmm. is get everybody to come to church. 
You know, go get your friends. See the people on the street. Look at them. You know, not even discern. She didn't even discern. That's how, of course, we know she wasn't spiritual because she couldn't even discern, mm-hmm. you know. And so that's what I wanted to add. So, guys, great topics. I love it. And thank you for allowing me to talk today. Appreciate you. Thank you. Thank you, Rhonda. Bro, wow. That, 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 <laughs> wow, that is deep. Inviting people to church, but not – there was – because when she was telling the story, I know I knew where she was going. I'm like, Jesus was, she was nowhere in this conver- Jesus was nowhere in the conversation. We, I'm telling you, man, the church system is good at getting you to invite people to church, but not to Christ. You understand what I'm saying? When, I mean, mm-hmm. where have you been in church and they really gave you real instruction on how to bring somebody to, to Christ? However, they got all ki- kinds of little flyers and handbills printed up. To, to, to give to you when you did it. Oh, take a, a fistful, take as many as you want. Take it, you know, like you pay, like you're promoting a party. That's what that's what party promoters do. They that's walk what up, it is, bro. They they walk around, they walk around in the city, they walk up on college campuses with these handbills printed up with all kinds of colorful, you know, stuff on them, and pass them to people to get people to come to the party. Well, now the church is doing the same thing. Look at some of these flyers that you see online. They're, I mean, they're getting you to come to these conferences. They're getting you to come to these church services. They're getting you to, and, and oftentimes to pay money, or register for this conference at this such and such website and pay your hundred dollar registration fee. Blah 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 blah. Jesus is nowhere involved in any of it. But you see all of these these people's uh, profile pictures and 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 stuff printed on these handbills with their title, Bishop such and such is going to speak, Pastor so and so. Uh, apostle, this, that, and the third. That's all it is. Sure. That's all it is. This, this sister said, this sister basically was approached by somebody that was a party promoter. Come to the church and see my pastor, see him perform, because my pastor's dynamic. You want to see him preach. You see what I'm saying? It's, it's amazing. This is the church system, man. It is. And the problem with all that, man, is I don't think, and the sad part is this sister, man, thought she was doing the right thing, bro. She thought she was doing right, just like yep, she like she I was, was saying right earlier. Thing. Yep, like I was saying yep. earlier, they think they're serving Christ by serving the system. Yep. It is a very skewed outlook on things. It's very, very skewed mentality, man. Very skewed mentality. She wow. thinks she thought that she, by her sending someone to her pastor or her church, that she was doing the right thing. Hmm. Plus, she was doing the right thing. She, she, but if you don't know who Jesus is for yourself, and you're involved in that type of thing, that's what you're going to do. If you don't know him for yourself, now what if the, the caller and her son were actually someone who were in need of who Jesus is? Mm-hmm. She didn't, this young lady didn't have what they needed. But she goes to a place that propagates, gives the impression that that thing is there that everyone needs. That's how dangerous it is, man. Mm-hmm. Oh, your car is out of gas? I'm going to send you to the liquor store where there's no gas right. Exactly. You, you know, but it'll make you feel good. Mm-hmm. It has something that's going to make your day a little brighter. You go ahead and get yourself a fifth and Hennessy and, you know, sit back and relax. But it doesn't have what you need. Right. And that's, and that's the problem with this. And this, that is why it's so dangerous. And I love the discernment of the caller. She did the mm-hmm. exact thing that you're, you're supposed to do. She didn't get into a wrestling match. She didn't get into a debate. She didn't attack this young lady. She mm-hmm. didn't attack the message of this young lady. She didn't even challenge the message. But if mm-hmm. the young lady would have said something, asked a particular question, it would have opened up the door for the caller to give her the truth. Exactly. But exactly. sometimes we're so overzealous and we see that these people are lost that we want to jump right in and give them what we perceive mm-hmm. that they're going to need. It's not too late for that young lady who just sent caller and her son to a place where they didn't need to go. It's not too late for it. Exactly. She still has opportunity. She she still she still has tons of opportunity. As long as she mm-hmm. has breath in her body, Jesus still can redeem her. And I think that's important for people to understand. For all the people who are trapped up in the system, who are still dealing with this foolishness time and time again, 
It's not too late for them. It's not That's too right. late. They still have an opportunity to hear the true message of what Jesus has done. But unfortunately, man, you got people who have been in the church 30 plus years who still don't understand the significance of Jesus' life, mm-hmm. the significance of his death, the significance mm-hmm. of his resurrection. And by not understanding those things, they will continue to fall into this cycle of unhealthy idolatry. Not that mm-hmm. idolatry can ever be healthy, but not understanding those three major components of your faith will leave you running on the institutionalized church cartwheel, spin wheel, time and time again, bro. It's just sad, homie. It's yeah. Sad. Yeah. Big time. Wow. It's sad, bro. It's sad. Any final thoughts, bro, before we go ahead and land this plane, man? Nah, man. You, I think uh, I think this has uh, been a great show, man. I, you know, if anything, I would just say, and, and it's basically what you just said, L, is to know Jesus for yourself. Just know who Jesus is for yourself. Know what his sacrifice is all about and uh, why he died for your sins. And... Uh, just know it for yourself. And it doesn't take a, a man. It doesn't take a building. It doesn't take a denomination. It doesn't take a church affiliation to do that. Just know it for yourself. Just call out to him. Spend time with Jesus. Know it for yourself. And just to piggyback off of what Rob said, man, uh, excellent ending, excellent summary, excellent uh, instruction to help you. But I just want to encourage you guys, man, who are listening live now, who are catching on the archive to help us. And what I'm asking is not for financial help. We're not asking you to to open up a checkbook or anything along those lines. We're asking you to help us get this message out to other people. If you believe in what we're saying, if you know that there's truth here and that there are people who need to hear this truth, to hear this open dialogue, to hear some brothers come together who don't think that they have it all together, don't think that they have all the answers, <laughs> who have arrived yet. We are right. some of the most fallible people on the planet who yeah. understand that we are in need of a, a awesome and amazing Savior, that we are thankful that he redeemed us. If you believe that this message is needed to be heard, man, we need your help in, in sharing the shows. Uh, mm-hmm. sharing the YouTube channel, sharing the website, just simply sharing it without commentary, without your own pop, uh, dialogue, is more than enough. We need your help. And that's all we're asking. Yeah. Uh, and, you know, you can continue to pray for some brothers, too. We, you know, we ain't never going to turn down some good prayer. <laughs> no uh, doubt. <laughs> you know, man, listen, when money is funny and change is strange, uh, and, the, and the pulpit looks like a great place to go to get some change. Exactly. Uh, you know, <laughs> we just ask, man, that you guys would continue to uh, pray for us, man, share the shows, and we truly and sincerely appreciate everything that you guys are doing. We thank all you guys for listening, man. Uh, there would be no Real Talk Radio without you guys. Okay. Truly and sincerely, we appreciate you. So I'm going to pray us out. And then we're going to dip off, man, and, and, you know, go watch some March Madness, uh, maybe eat some neck bones or something, you know, just kind of relax for the rest of the day. Uh, (laughs) Most gracious and heavenly Father, we love you. We thank you for all that you do. We thank you for all that you've done. We thank you for this platform, this opportunity to have open, honest dialogue and discussion about the things that I believe grieve you, that frustrate you, But, Lord, we thank you for the grace and mercy to be able to come and give it in a loving fashion, in a loving manner. We pray that someone would hear this message today, Father, and begin to ask some of the difficult questions, ask some of the challenging questions. We appreciate you, Lord. We love you and we thank you for all that you do. We pray these things just in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Thank you for listening to this week's episode of Real Talk Radio. Check out our website at www.4realtalkradio.com for updates on all of our social media platforms, including our YouTube channel and Facebook page. Feel free to
to send us any of your comments, questions, or criticisms. If this show or any of our past shows have helped you in any way, please feel free to share it with your friends and family. See you next week.